All right. Welcome. Welcome to the AOE seminar. Yes. Let's do it. I, I don't think anybody's introducing me. So I am Shane Ross. I'm going to talk about research activities in my lab. So I gave this nice name. Um, these are just some of the activities. Let's see if everything works. There we go. Hey. So I'm a full professor in aerospace and ocean engineering. And uh, I've probably been here less time than you. But I've been at Virginia Tech for like 13 years. So just some background about me. I'm originally from California. Um, I have to speak loudly because there's this exclusion zone of the first four <laughs> rows where everyone's afraid. I don't spit or anything. In 1981, I was a wee lad, and I saw the first space shuttle launch, and I wanted to be an astronaut, maybe like many of you. Um, and then I changed my mind, and I decided physics and astronomy was kind of my main motivator, and that was more fun. So I went to Caltech, got a bachelor's degree in physics. Um, Stayed on and worked at JPL for a little while, working on some space missions, and then went back to Caltech for a PhD in a weird little degree program called Control and Dynamical Systems. It's kind of like applied math, but it was in an engineering department. Um, in 2004, I was a consultant for Boeing, and then I did a postdoc at USC, University of Southern California, in the aerospace and mechanical engineering. Came to Virginia Tech, where I was a professor in the Engineering Science and Mechanics Department. And then uh, I was graduate director for a while. Then switched over to AOE last August. So here I am, letting you know about what's happening in, the, in our lab. So we do a bunch of stuff. Here are some research areas. Uh, one big theme is Hamiltonian systems. This is some of the more fundamental work that we do. And it's what got me started, it's what I did for my PhD. I do something just general theory of Hamiltonian systems. These are, these are, it's a way to describe mechanical systems. Uh, a lot on orbital mechanics. It's kind of what the first half of my uh, talk will be about today because it's interesting. Um, and then some stuff about ship dynamics, dynamic buckling, and flexible structures, which I handle all of this in the Hamiltonian setting. And then um, some other work, which may not seem related, but it's dispersal of particles and the ocean and the atmosphere. And one of the main applications there is spread of plant diseases and pollen. Uh, also some work on things that move through the air and are, have strongly coupled translational and rotational motion. And I mean things like leaves, stuff falling from the sky, how does it move? Uh, so that relates to dynamic lighting and passive lighting. I've also done some work on unique applications of drones or other unmanned aerial systems, and yada yada. Anyway, so orbital mechanics, that's exciting. Um, I worked with the NASA on the Genesis Solar Wind Sample Return Mission, and that eventually evolved into a much larger topic on the design of what are called low energy or low fuel interplanetary missions. Um, we've called it things like the Interplanetary Transport Network or the Interplanetary Superhighway. Uh, that's back when people were referring to the internet as the information superhighway. But now, like, you know, the internet is just part of the air we breathe, so we don't care. Um, so, a lot was made of this because you could make cool visualizations of tubes in space, and people get it wrong most of the time. Like, it's definitely not this. Jetson flying through space in tubes, that's not what it is. It's not whatever that is. Uh, but I'll talk about what it is. That's French. Um, <laughs> that, that would die. Come on. There we go. So how do we do this? Well, we're looking at the map of all the low energy paths. This is just an artist's rendering. It looks like tubes moving through the solar system. But think of it as their special direction, special places you could be where you can ride currents moving through space. And by currents here, I just mean free falling. And Right now, we're in a free fall setting where if you let go of something and it just sort of falls straight to the earth. But if you've got multiple bodies, you'll have the gravitational touch of multiple things, and it gets rather complicated. So it's a bit like the currents that uh, ancient mariners would use to get around the earth. Um, now we've got these two things. Um, 
moving through space. And we learned about it by looking at natural objects like comets and how they ride these things. So this is a comet, it's called Oterma, named after its discoverer. It does something interesting. So we're viewing, this down here is a comet, there's the sun, this is Jupiter, and it does an interesting dance during these few decades from 1910 to 1980. It passes by Jupiter on the inside of Jupiter's orbit, and then has another encounter with Jupiter and goes outside. So from a like, mission design point of view, it for free does an interesting transfer here. And we'll eventually, hopefully, have a better understanding of what um, Comet's doing. But what we do is we, you know, what makes these things move along strange paths? We look at the motion of a particle. In this case, the comet, since it's so small compared to other bodies in the solar system, you could treat it like a particle in the field of two large bodies, in this case, the Sun and Jupiter. So let's look at the comet in the field of uh, the Sun and Jupiter. So first, you have to have the, the two-body problem solved, so the motion of Jupiter around the Sun, solved by Kepler. Um, Newton came in and wanted to look at uh, what happened to the third body under the gravitational influence of these two. You can write down the equations of motion. They're very compact. This U is a, is a potential energy function. Um, so just we're just thinking of the two-dimensional system. So we're in, uh, the comet is in the plane of Jupiter and the Sun, and Jupiter is moving in a circular orbit around the Sun. So what's the motion of the comet? You write it simply. Uh, but it was unsolvable, so we gave up. But now we have computers, and we can do other things. Um, this is a you know, kind of the idea of a gravitational well have things going around the gravitational well. You drop coins into those things that they have at science museums, lots of fun. But we've got a, a gravitational field. So from the point of view of the comet, there's a gravitational field around uh, the sun, there's a gravitational field around Jupiter. So you've got two gravity wells. And it's kind of weird. You've got this one gravity well moving around the other gravity well. And what I've highlighted here, these are special points of balance. They're called Lagrange points. And these are the ones that we study. There's other points of balance, but these are the two main ones that are on either side of Jupiter. And they go around uh, in orbit, kind of with Jupiter. So they're, think of them as co-orbiting points, where if you're there, you will stay there. Uh, so these are the two points. That's where all the forces balance and you park your own wrist. Because it's unstable, if you're a little bit off of that, you'll go away. So Euler, uh, another mathematician, physicist from 1700s, he came up with three points. He found these three points where forces balance. Lagrange was his student, he came along and found two others. And they now bear his name. So they're, we usually label them this way. Say the one between the two masses is L1, and then there's L2 over here, and those are the two we'll focus on. They're unstable. L4 and L5, saw a lot of press um, in the 60s and 70s. People wanted to put a space station there because they're stable points. Uh, L3 is another one. It, they're called collinear ones, L1, L2, and L3. They're collinear with the two massive bodies, and they're all three unstable. So let's just focus on L1 and L2. Poincaré came along in the late 1800s, and he, he's the one who developed chaos theory. He did a lot of work, especially on the three-body problem. So this exact problem, and discovered chaos in it, even long before we had computers that showed us the chaos. Um, kind of the, the engines of the chaos are that around L1 and L2, there are periodic orbits. They're unstable periodic orbits, but they're periodic orbits nonetheless. In fact, these orbits get used in space missions because uh, they have a long time scale for how unstable they are, but they are unstable. And so here's kind of an idea of what they look like in terms of the gravity field. You've got these points of balance, and there's orbits around these unstable points of balance. Not only are they periodic orbits, but they're, I'm showing here, a green surface that's winding onto this L2 orbit. It's a surface made up of a bunch of individual trajectories. So if I show down here, this is a you know, basket. Think of a, a tube made of individual trajectories all winding onto this periodic orbit. Red are things that are all winding off. 
And this is just a consequence of being a Hamiltonian system. If you have an unstable periodic orbit, there has to be some set of trajectories winding onto it and some set of trajectories winding off of it. So you can connect these things. If you connect them because they look like tubes, we call it tube dynamics. So this is something that's on one tube, the tube kind of coming from L1 and winding off. And then if, if you're inside this other tube, you'll kind of go past that periodic orbit, move on. You could have something that's on two tubes, a uh, tube winding off of and a tube winding onto, and that's called a connection. You can also have things that are inside the tube. So not on the surface of the tube, they're inside it. And that is motion that kind of travels around Jupiter and can escape in either, either direction. So these Lagrange points and their periodic orbits around it and these things winding onto and off of them, these tubes are like gateways. And if you're outside of the gateway, you just sort of bounce back completely. So these exist. Comets do things with them. And now I'll show side by side. This is what we saw before. This would be an, the motion of Comet Oterma in the inertial frame. And on the right, the motion of Comet Oterma in the Sun-Jupiter rotating frame. So this is a frame. It's like we've taken the camera, and the camera is rotating exactly at the rate that Jupiter is orbiting around the Sun. So on this x-axis, the Sun and Jupiter are always fixed. And let me just show the motion in both frames. So this thing, the comet actually passes by these gateways near Jupiter and then exits again. So that helps us understand this weird motion over here. And we can learn from the comet to save fuel. So we're learning from nature to save fuel, because that thing that the comet did happened for free. If I had a, a rock, it would do the same thing. If I put a spacecraft in the right in initial condition, it would do the same thing. And it doesn't have to be with the sun and Jupiter. It could be with the sun and Earth, or Earth and the moon and the spacecraft. So let's look in the Earth's neighborhood. In the Earth's neighborhood, we have, we've got the sun, and here's the Earth. And there's those points of balance on either side of the Earth. They're called L1 and L2. We might call them the Sun-Earth L1 and Sun-Earth L2. Um, and the orbits around them are called halo orbits. Because if, you were to, if you're standing on the Earth and you look towards the Sun, it looks like these orbits are forming a halo around the Sun. In the, this is the Moon's orbit. The Moon is about a quarter of the way to either L1 or L2. And there are points of balance in the Earth-Moon system, too. So those are the uh, lunar L1 and lunar L2. And these, uh, all of these things have tubes, and they're all connected. Uh, we used some of the, these uh, points of balance and the periodic orbits around them for this mission called the, the Genesis mission. Its focus was on, um, it took off from Earth, went into this point of balance, L1, which faces the sun. And then some panels opened up that were just gathering the solar wind. So solar wind are these high energy particles streaming out of the sun. They were collected in these kind of bicycle tire size collectors, um, sealed back up, and then this thing came back to Earth. It had to come back to Earth on the day side, so it had to actually do this weird excursion, and then it's the blue trajectory that actually comes back on, on the day side because it was captured by a, well, this is what was supposed to happen. What was supposed to happen is as this capsule uh, entered the Utah desert, uh, the, a parachute would deploy and a helicopter would capture this thing. But, and this is where you know, a $150 million mission can go wrong. Somebody put some explosive in backwards, so the parachute did not deploy. Instead, this capsule came in at terminal velocity and slammed exactly where the mission designer said it should. So I had nothing to do with that. They were able to get some data from this, so it wasn't a complete failure. Um, and these ideas of these tubes were definitely involved in the design of this uh, mission. So it's kind of the first mission where they used this new technique of uh, those tubes are also called invariant manifolds. So if you've heard of manifold dynamics or anything like that related to space missions, this is what they're talking about. So getting back to Sun, Earth, Moon region, um, let me give you a little picture. I think this is a movie. So coming from the view of the sun, here's the Earth. Here's a spacecraft in orbit around the Earth. 
And here is an L2 orbit around the Sun Earth L2 point. And we're showing a superhighway made up of a bunch of individual trajectories as it intersects this orbit around the Earth. And if you wanted to deliver something to that orbit, you just need to get it onto this green surface, this manifold, and you get the transfer for free. And that just is just another picture showing you can get, if you're exactly on the surface of the tube, then you wind onto these periodic orbits. If you're inside the tube, then you kind of pass by. If you're outside the tube, then you kind of bounce back. And you could use these ideas to do things like tube hopping and uh, design missions that do very interesting things and use no fuel or very little fuel to achieve it. That's it for uh, the orbital mechanics. This is actually part of a, there's a larger topic here. So the, the end body gravitational problem, it's just one example of things called escaping dynamics that's in a lot of mechanical systems. So some examples of escaping dynamics are buckling of a beam, which you can view as passage by one of these points of balance. Um, the flipping over of an umbrella, it's really annoying. Uh, even ship capsize, chemical reactions, uh, the free body problem like I was talking about, and then that's just the ship capsize again. And so how is this the case? Well, for I think I'll talk about the ship example later, so forget about that. We call this general idea of uh, where you found these points of balance, unstable points of balance, and tubes that go from one side to the other, we call that tube dynamics. Um, it was started by some mathematicians in the 1960s, and then eventually, uh, and this was before we had readily available computers. With computers, we were able to use these things for designing space missions, but you could also use it to analyze a bunch of different other phenomena. So um, orbital mechanics is nice because there's no dissipative forces, no non-conservative forces. It's usually just gravity. Um, maybe you could consider uh, force of low thrust, um, but we want to consider in general what's what's the effect on these tube things when we consider dissipative forces or gyroscopic forces, so force due to rotation, and even stochastic forces, so noise or some kind of stochastic signal. So these can lead to departures from the kind of idealized, calling them cylinders, because locally tubes look like cylinders. They have the geometry of cylinders. So one really simple test bed is a, we've got this machine surface, the piece of lectern maybe about this big, and uh, we put in it a few potential wells. So this is a potential energy surface. You can machine it um, however you want. We designed it so that there are four wells, there's a hilltop up here, and connecting the four wells, there are these saddle points. I think that, that movie, if you watch it, this point, it kind of visits a bunch of different places. It almost does a little periodic motion right there, because that's near one of the saddle points. And due to energy dissipation, because of realistic friction, this thing just sort of settles down in one of the wells. So this is a, a rolling ball on a stationary surface. And the way that you would uh, analyze this in terms of a mathematical model is you'd write the Lagrangian, get Euler-Lagrange equations. And then uh, we like turning things into a Hamiltonian form. So the Hamiltonian approach is you just, you instead of looking at configuration space variables and their time derivatives, you look at configuration space variables and momentum as uh, another set of coordinates. And then you get Hamilton's equations, which are really nice. But we care about, so we're, we care about behavior near these, they're called rank one saddles. Um, what we have done is using that rolling ball on, on the surface, we use that as a test bed to see if, um, if we could look at the comparison between the theory and experiment, because we can't do this in celestial mechanics, we can't, you know, initiate 100,000 uh, comets, but we could do it with a ball on the surface and just record it with a camera up above and do some analysis. So our experiment showed that these tubes really do exist. You could see that they're, they're effect. Um, even when uh, the periodic orbits, the unstable periodic orbits are so unstable, you can't really see motion on the periodic orbit, but you see the effects of these tubes emanating from them. It's kind of interesting. And this could relate to other types of systems that have, um, have multiple potential wells. Let's say in the case of a, uh, a beam, 
a beam buckled one way versus the other way corresponds to two different locally stable equilibria. And in this case, we're using a needle to push through and kind of go over the saddle point, go from one stable configuration to the other. But if you could understand the geometry of how these different things are happening, you could do controlled dynamic buckling and get some interesting morphing behavior for a material. So here is a just a simple idealized shallow arch snapping through. Uh, you could 3D print things. This is just, this is a, a continuum system, but if you just look at the top two modes, this is say mode one, so that symmetric mode, and here's the anti-symmetric mode two. You could look at the elastic potential energy in just these two degrees of freedom and you get a potential energy surface. So I'm showing contours, this is a potential well, here's a potential well, and then there's saddle points. Um, if you, as you change configurations, like how symmetric is this arch, you get slightly different potential wells, but they all have basically the same topology. There's two wells, there's a hilltop, and then there's two saddle points. And we care about these rank one saddles. Um, maybe I won't go over this so much. The tubes basically collapse into uh, ellipses or ellipsoids. And then this is, this is just more details of how do you look at a high dimensional phase space, you take slices named after Poincaré called Poincaré surfaces of section. And you can make really cool looking uh, pictures. But you know, eventually, at the end of the day, you want to use this in experiments. We haven't yet done this for the, uh, the buckling arch experiment. But the same kind of situation holds if you look at a ship. So ship dynamics. Let's say we just looked at pitch and roll of a ship. Here's a ship in a situation that I never want to be. Um, but how does the ship right itself? Well, there's, there's buoyancy and things, and that leads to a potential energy surface where right in the middle, there's a potential well, and that's the ship nice and stable. And then there are saddle points that correspond to, and if you've, just, you've tipped just enough that now you're gonna go to capsize. And here's a ship that actually did capsize. That is not what you want. And there's the, some kind of critical angle. You go beyond that, follow. So we can look at the, in the, uh, using x as the roll variable, y as the pitch. We have a four-dimensional phase space. There's x, y, x dot, y dot. And we could look at the boundary between uh, imminent capsize and no capsize. And then we could look at the effect of stochastic forces. In this case, stochastic forces would correspond to random waves, so random wave forcing. Even if you have random wave forcing, there's still regions of high probability of capsides that are right where we would expect them in the kind of idealized no random wave case. So this is for a significant wave height of five meters for a particular size uh, fishing vessel. If we double that, so a significant wave height of 10 meters, okay, like these are waves as big as this room, nightmarish. Um, but there's still some region of capsides that peaks right where we would expect it using the tube dynamics framework. Um, we don't have any plans to do any experiments with ship dynamics as of yet, but we're looking at more, you know, how do we push this to, instead of two degrees of freedom, look at three or more degrees of freedom. And three degrees of freedom, you can do a nice tabletop experiments. So this is a kind of triple pendulum thing. It's got a spring and then just masses connected by rods with uh, pivot joints. So you've got three angles, theta one, theta two, theta three, those are your three degrees of freedom. These are kind of potential energy contours. Um, these black circles are saddle points. So they're the things that control whether you're in a stable configuration over here or a stable configuration over here, which means this thing is leaning to the right or it's leaning to the left. So it's kind of a multi-length version of a continuous buckling beam. So we will eventually do some experiments on that. Um, all right, so switching gears a little bit. From my point of view, it's not a whole lot, because when I view dynamics of particles or rigid bodies, I'm visualizing them as moving in some higher dimensional fluid space. So um, I may as well just look at actual fluids. So we're, now we're gonna talk about motion of fluids. It's not necessarily this Hamiltonian in nature, but there's still these structures um, that we'll call Lagrangian coherent structures. 
since it's related to following particles in a fluid, so Lagrangian fluid dynamics. So these are just a few examples of uh, scenarios where you have these things, Lagrangian coherent structures, or LCS. This is a view of uh, eddies in, in the ocean. On a smaller scale, these are people being dragged out to sea at a beach, I think in Korea. So they're being sucked out along, you could call it a riptide if you want, but I'm gonna call it an attracting structure. Uh, this is the Gulf of Mexico oil spill from 2010. And this is the how the oil spill is spreading. Uh, this is the inside of a human heart. It's the revolving door. And then we've got atmospheric things going on. So these are tools, they were developed uh, about 15 years ago, and now they're being used in a bunch of different areas. So these Lagrangian coherent structures. The basic idea is pretty simple. There are, let's say in a 2D fluid, there are certain curves which attract fluid to them. We call those attracting LCS. Then there's other curves that repel fluid. So here's the effect on the fluid blob of an attracting curve. We've got this nice circular fluid blob. It'll spread out along an attracting surface or attracting LCS. Uh, a repelling one will get pulled normal to it. In 3D, we have 2D surfaces. And these 2D surfaces have the same kind of effect. If you have a blob of particles, they will spread out along an attracting surface and they will be repelled from a repelling surface. And then you might have these things coexisting and even intersecting in a flow. So this is a, an artist picture of, here we are, Virginia, and there's these gigantic atmospheric LCS. Uh, so if you had particles on either side, in this case, this orange thing is a repelling LCS, they're going to move away from each other and be stuck on perhaps the same uh, attracting LCS two different branches. There's a branch that went to the right, branch that went to the left. All right. There are applications to motion, motion in the ocean, um, like oil spills, chemical spills, and also people. You have people in the water, uh, either uh, treading water or in uh, life vests for a search and rescue situation. Maybe these ideas could be helpful. Um, so this was a hypothesis we had. We called these things transient attracting profiles that might be helpful for search and rescue. So the idea is once people are in the water, they may get attracted to these. The surface of the ocean is 2D, so that means there are these curves that will be locally attracting. So we would expect people to be on these things. Uh, traps, nice acronym. So we don't know if there was really a trap here. This is just a uh, schematic to give you an idea. Um, and if you're wondering, you know, is search and rescue a big deal? In the US, there are 4,000 events the Coast Guard has to respond to. And they have a 75% success rate. And that means they've recovered the person alive. Uh, we'd like that to be closer to 100%. That's just in, in the US. In the Mediterranean, I, it was a couple of years ago, 5,000 people died trying to cross the Mediterranean to get to Europe. This is a, a photo from one of those uh, uh, capsizes. So if the, if the authorities had a way to quickly find uh, where people are, uh, maybe using some interesting you know, fluid analysis could help them reduce that search time from say 12 hours, which is way too long, down to six hours. It's kind of generally accepted that if you can get to someone within six hours, you're, you're much more likely to recover them alive. So we did some experiments. Um, so this was a bigger group that was uh, with MIT, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, Berkeley, and then a group here at Virginia Tech that involved Craig Woolsey, myself, and uh, David Schmalley, who's in the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences, and uh, Javier, Gonzalez Rocha, who uh, was the pilot in command for a lot of the drone work we did here. In fact, he took these videos. So that's me wearing a hard hat, because if you've ever tried to capture a quadcopter um, on a moving vessel, it's very hard, and they might hit you. He did his best. But so we have these, uh, we have these dummies. They're actually sitting in Randolph right now. We had six of them, all instrumented, and we released them on kind of a grid pattern 
tracking how they moved and then using the drones to track uh, the wind, um, to measure the wind, because there's the two effects. There's the effect of the ocean current and the wind, and they affect you almost equally. So even though a small portion of you is sticking up, the winds are higher than ocean currents. So we did an experiment to see if these uh, mannequins would be attracted to a trap. And we found, we're still analyzing it, but we basically found that yes, they do. And we're still working on that. All right. So as another application of studying particle motion in, in flows, I've done a lot of work with um, a plant pathologist colleague, uh, David Schmalley, uh, studying the spread of pollen and plant diseases. And this has significance to farmers who care about if a plant disease is going to affect them. If you grow corn, you want to know if a corn disease is coming your way. So are there uh, kind of reduced order models to figure that, that out? We did an experiment at uh, Kentland Farm. So Kentland Farm is this 3,000 acre farm that's about 10 miles from here, owned by Virginia Tech. We had a source of a disease. In this case, it was the uh, potato, the pathogen that caused, caused the potato blight. And we were releasing it um, in a kind of half acre field. This is what the signal looked like in terms of the how much disease was being dispersed over a two week period, especially towards the end. These are kind of daily spikes. And that was an input to a model that would tell us how this was spreading. So this is changing directions according to the wind. Each of these black dots was a, a sensor where we were capturing the disease so that we could verify how well we could uh, uh, predict. When people look at the spread of plant diseases, really spread of anything through the air as an input to a model, one way to summarize it is a dispersal kernel. So a dispersal kernel gives an amount of the disease deposited as a function of distance. So over a one kilometer distance, we were able to predict uh, the amount of this that got deposited pretty well from our model. That was good. Uh, there's other things that you could do, and this is where there's techniques from uh, dynamical systems, complex systems, we wanted to know what were the environmental causal factors of the disease being released. So I mean, what should you imagine, what's the disease being released? If you have a piece of diseased plant material, there's all these little dots on it. Each of the dots, you can see them, they're tiny. Each of the dots has within it about uh, 300 fungal spores. And when conditions are right, and we don't know what that means. When conditions are right, the fungal spores are forcefully ejected and I guess nature is hoping that it'll get carried to the next susceptible plant. So this is how, it, like, you know how we cough and sneeze? Well, this is how plants cough and sneeze. So that field that we had, it had, uh, I think, 10 billion spores within it, and so they were slowly released over two weeks. And we'd like to know, well, and if I'm a farmer, I want to know when are these, when is the disease most likely to spread? So you can look at environmental signals. In our case, we looked at things that you could easily measure with a weather station, like air temperature, wind speed, uh, humidity. And we used this technique that was invented by some ecologists called the convergent cross mapping. And we were able to uh, find out what are the most relevant in environmental signals. It ended up being solar radiation, relative humidity, air temperature, and wind speed. So before you would even go in and construct a physics-based model, it's good to know out of everything that could be causal, what are the main few? So we ruled out a couple of things. In this case, soil temperature and absolute humidity. They just aren't important. So we've done a lot of work with uh, uh, modeling how things spread and then trying to verify it by uh, looking at what drones measure. So this is one of the fixed wing drones. It's kind of hard to see, but there's some Petri dishes here that are closed right now. Once you reach a certain desired altitude, you can open up the Petri dishes and just measure microbes. Um, I prefer quadcopters because they're easier to handle. So we've done some modeling uh, of plant disease spread. Now we're starting to do, this is a new project with the USDA of tracking, that shouldn't say polling, should say pollen, sorry. Looking at pollen, oh, you'll like this. It's pollen from weed. 
This is weed, about 10 miles away. There's different varieties of weed. They can't stop you from wandering through it if you want. Um, and as, as far as I know, this is the first federally funded grant to study marijuana. And you might, why do people care about marijuana? Really? I'm from California. Everyone cares about marijuana. Um, <laughs> No, you care because there's also CBD oil. People want CBD oil, there's nothing wrong with it. I have a hard time convincing colleagues and family and friends that yeah, there's nothing illegal about CBD oil. There's different permits. We grow CBD oil here. You can grow, it's off the I-81. There's a whole giant farm. So don't try to steal it. Somebody tried to steal it. It's, it doesn't have THC, and that's the whole idea. It's the same exact plant, but a different strain. There's the low THC variety grown for CBD and other purposes. And then there's the high THC variety. We all know what that's for. And if they're grown in the same locality, you don't want them accidentally cross-pollinate because then you have to throw out your crop. Nobody wants that. So what we're going to do is, is, this is just a project that's starting. There is a special field of uh, hemp. I'll call it hemp. Um, but it's, it's, it we'll be studying. And uh, we're just going to first model how far this thing could spread, and then fly drones, the quadcopter type drone with sensors on it, to measure the pollen. And then see if we could validate our, our model. What do we want to get out of this? We want to get something like, here's the isolation distance. If you have a field, and here are the conditions, here are the hills, here's the typical winds, here's how far away the pollen could possibly spread. Let's say it's five kilometers. Then you could say, all right, there's a five kilometer isolation radius around this field. So if somebody wants to grow a different strain, they have to be outside of five kilometers. So it's going to help the USDA with regulations. Well, actually, we won't get to the hemp the first year. We'll get to that later. Um, we're going to start with switchgrass. So this is with David Schmalley and uh, Hossein Foratan, who's in the uh, environmental engineer. Um, there's Javier and me catching the drone. Here I don't have the protective helmet, because I guess I was more trusting we're not on a moving ship. This is at a quarry nearby, but I am wearing these like skillet gloves just in case. I don't want those whirling blades of death to hurt me. Um, Javier and Craig Woolsey have developed a system where they can use the drone, just the motion of the drone itself, to determine uh, wind. So wind speed and wind direction. So instead of having to attach some kind of anemometer, wind measurement device on top of a drone, you just use perturbations to the drone itself. Which is, it kind of turns any drone into a wind measuring instrument, which is, could be revolutionary. Um, and they've done some comparisons in uh, flight campaigns. This was a campaign in Colorado where the, here's a typical uh, tower. It's got a bunch of instruments on it. It's a 10 meter tower. And then drones were flown at the same height and comparisons were made. And it, the drones measure the wind, the, the wind that this kind of standard thing measured uh, to very high degree, which means you could use drones instead of portable, uh, unsightly things um, if you want to do precise weather measurements. Because we can get not just wind, that was kind of a hard one to get, but temperature, pressure, relative humidity, that could all be on board. So you could have on-demand weather uh, measurements and then very, very focused local forecasting. And that could be very useful for a number of things. One of them that relates to kind of this area around here, especially during winter, is when should you put out ice? I mean, when, when, did you, when should you put out salt on the roads and where? If there were much better forecasts about if it's going to snow or not, we all know it's forecasts around here are notoriously terrible. Um, could we do something better if we could kind of send our swarm of drones to measure and then um, estimate that? Or downed power lines. If you know ahead of time which power lines are going to get iced up, then you could send repair trucks out there and uh, minimize the amount of time people are without power, especially during a time of year when they do not want to be without power. All right. Uh, last topic. Not really related to the others, except in my mind, but I like interesting things. So we're going to look at passive and active aerodynamic lighting. It, it somehow it grew out of the other stuff, but I don't know. It escapes me. Uh, you've all probably seen maple seeds. They're the things that when they come off the tree, they 
they move like helicopters. Some people call them whirly birds. Uh, maybe it's like a regional thing, I don't know. Um, the name of the shape is a Samara. So we're talking the seed, this is the seed of the plant and it grows this wing that's very lightweight and then there's the seed part. So this is heavy, this is light. The, the center of mass is probably about a quarter of the way down the length, so about there. And we thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool to be inspired by the shape of a maple seed? Could we design little sensors that are maple seeds, drop them from airplanes or whatever, and use them for environmental sensing? Maybe they're very tiny, they don't have enough much power, but they can kind of communicate across the network of themselves and help us do uh, measurements of weather or hazard assessment. So we did, we basically scanned a maple seed and then printed it just like you would with a piece of paper, 3D printed. This is kind of a, this, we didn't really scan it to great detail, at least not for this first iteration. So this is kind of a stylized seed that was made. And then we did a competition, the natural versus the 3D printed. If you drop them, how well do they do? I'll just give you the punchline. The natural ones did better. They, they fall slower and they move further under the wind. So we took these things outside, dropped them all from the same standard height, different wind conditions and the natural ones always went further. But we didn't really try very hard here. We've since tried harder. But this led to some other ideas of what if instead of using the small maple seed size we just made a gigantic thing that was maple seed size and then put actuators on it and a VT logo and just go crazy. Then this could be this could be an airdrop system. You could put things here maybe up to a kilogram of something and so instead of having to do uh, airdrops, and when airdrops are usually done, like by the military, they're dropping a ton. And they need a huge infrastructure to do it, a giant plane to drop this out of the back. So what if we could just use a large Samara to, as an kind of individual airdrop delivery system without a parachute? And we thought, well, okay, maybe you could use this for uh, delivering emergency supplies to uh, places like hit by floods or other disasters, or maybe deliver medicine uh, to someone in a wilderness survival situation. So the idea was we've got a drone, this is like DJI Phantom 3, everyone's favorite drone, giant hook, and then we drop one of these maple seed pots. Uh, and you could deliver medicine if it was a gentle enough fall or blankets, things like that. So we built a prototype. So we have a seed-inspired airdrop. This is the this is the size of a human hand, and this thing is about this big. I didn't bring it, sorry. Um, in fact, this is a nice space for flying drones. Right, yeah. So we have an instrumentation package in here just to measure pressure, which gives us height, and then you could even do GPS tracking. So we drop this from a drone, um, and yeah, it, the hook did not look like that. But you, I mean, there's an easy triggering mechanism where you could kind of fly the drone where you want and then drop. So here are, here's a ground view and a drone's eye view of dropping the maple seed. You see, it goes into this auto rotation mode. So instead of this thing hitting the ground at uh, terminal velocity, it kind of gently lands. So if you had some vial um, medicine or something, it will survive the fall. Plus, you can have multiple um, airdrops per drone. So one drone could go and deliver to multiple places, or maybe you drop a bunch of these um, to one place that uh, needs emergency relief. We, we've done several tests since then of, okay, what's the, what's the trade-off between performance and how much weight you can put in, in this? And I think our idea is that you would have different size maple seeds pods for different weight classes. So if you have half a kilo to one kilo, you've got a certain size, then you just kind of scale up from there. But these could be easily mass produced. We've made this one by hand, but I think you could just sort of make a nice plastic mold and uh, make tons of these like Ikea style or something. All right, last topic, very weird. Uh, when I first came to Virginia Tech, uh, I met this guy, Jake Soha, who, he's in Beam. Uh, 
And he, he's obsessed with these flying snakes. And I'm like, what were you talking about? Flying snakes, really? And yeah, they really are flying snakes. So here's one of the snakes jumping. They jump and they undulate. So they're like a living morphing wing. And they're really cool. And they're only 60 feet away from us right now. I cannot disclose where they are, but they're not very far from us. So they live in uh, Southeast Asia and Blacksburg. They have not gotten loose in Blacksburg. This is a film from Malaysia. And there they are, they hit the ground. It's not clear why they jump and glide, but they do. They, they live in the trees. There's a whole, whole like genus of snakes that live in trees, which is nightmarish. And then these things will jump. And they're not trying to hurt you. They're tiny, they're as wide as a garden hose, and they're like this long, and I guess they're cute. If you like snakes, I don't think they're cute. Uh, they pee on you, and it's gross. Uh, they bite, it doesn't hurt, though. These are some experiments we did at the Moss Art Center in a place called the Cube, which is already equipped with 24 camera uh, uh, infrared tracking system. So we put reflective markers along the snake, and you can see these are just different snapshots in time. You can kind of see the reflective markers along it. This is a kind of a one of the idealized snapshots. The airflow is coming this way, and it's got a few surfaces that are normal to the airflow. So those provide most of the lift. And then you've got these what we call U bends. And what we'd like to do is understand how this thing flies, and also why does it undulate. So here is a, a reconstructed uh, flight of a snake. Just from doing the marker tracking, we had 15 markers along it, and they were kind of fitting a spline at each moment in time, and then putting a realistic uh, cross-sectional shape. And you can see it's got some interesting 3D motion going on. In fact, it's got coupled uh, horizontal waves traveling down its body and vertical waves. We've got 36 trials that are reconstructed to a high level of detail, because it's hard to get animals to do anything. Um, there are probably 200 trials and 36 where, where the snake went right in the range where we had uh, a good coverage of our sensors. But once we've got that, then we can do things like uh, ask the question, why does the snake undulate? Because if, if you took one of the snakes in a certain posture and dipped it in liquid nitrogen and tossed it, uh, what would you get? Well, first, here's the snake. Here's kind of an idealized snake from a simulation where it's undulating. This is a side view. This is vertical. Uh, we're starting with a 10 meter drop down to the ground. And we're showing the lift and drag distribution along the body of this living morphing wing. And it you know, nicely makes it to the ground. It's not a very good glider. It is one of the worst gliders in nature, actually. A uh, flying squirrel would probably jump and you know, stay horizontal. But the fact that this basically one-dimensional thing can glide at all is pretty interesting. And with a simulation, so as opposed to actually freezing a snake and tossing it, which would be cruel, you can just turn off undulation in the simulation. So this is another simulation, but there's no undulation. And because the load due to the aerodynamic forces is unbalanced, this thing just tends to tip over and not go anywhere. So that's why snakes don't just kind of get paralyzed with fear, uh, because then they would land upside down. And it's say, biologically, you don't want to land upside down. And they, they, they never do. Uh, they're like cats, I guess. They always land right side up. Uh, there's even been cases where they've seen them jump and kind of get hit by a branch and get very perturbed, but then they will right themselves. This is something animals do. All right, so we're, we're studying the snakes, and maybe we'll have flying robots that are snake-like at some point. Who knows? So just to summarize, we study Hamiltonian systems. And um, I focus a lot on the orbital mechanics of three and four body problems. But there's Hamiltonian systems is a larger topic. There's also these Lagrangian coherent structures that help us understand uh, where particles will, where it will accumulate in fluid flows, and we've applied it to ocean and atmospheric dynamics. Uh, in my lab, we like to do measurements combined with modeling for th how things spread. Um, and then we're also looking at new mechanisms of gliding flight. 
like the snake and the, uh, the maple seed. So that's it. If you want to know more, uh, you can check out my website, whatever. Or you can come talk to me. So that's it. Thanks. I guess I could open it up to questions. Other questions? You, sir. Is it possible to control how the maple uh, tea thing uh, tastes like if you're twisting it three times more than normal body to fall apart? Like so lateral motion? Yeah. Right now, we don't know. What, we can, what we've been able to see is that the larger maple seed shape uh, drifts much less than the small ones, right? Because they're they're larger. Uh, so that's that's good for us if we want to deliver a larger package. In terms of steering, that becomes tricky because then you'd have to you'd have to add more electronics, I think, to the system. We want something that's passive, like here's the delivery system. Just put what you want in it and let let it go. So we're we're trying to get away from additional electronics, although that's something one could pursue. Yeah, yeah. If we have a good idea of what the uh, what the wind profile looks like from the ground up to where we release, then we could do a calculated air release point to get to the delivery point, which is what they do for parachute delivery. But they're delivering from 1,500 meters, and we're thinking more like 15 meters. And this one question has been asked before: well, Why not just land and deliver the package? In some places, we're thinking of something that could be autonomous. It's very hard for autonomous vehicles right now to land because the ground is very unpredictable. The wing drone delivery system that's in Christiansburg does not land. It lowers something by a tether, so it's got some additional complications to how it does the delivery, but it, it does not get within 30 feet of the ground. They want to just drop something and get out of there. Um, you don't want these things landing, especially if it's an unpredictable terrain, maybe due to a, a disaster, like a flood. If not, thanks. See you guys later.